Amen. If you would, take out your sermon notes and your pen from your service guide, or you can follow along on your cell phone using the YouVersion app. And we're wrapping up our summer series on the book of 1 Corinthians. Believe it or not, there are other books in the Bible except 1 Corinthians. And some of you may find that shocking because we have been in 1 Corinthians since the Sunday after Easter. And so some of you are like, I think we got the book covered, PC. Well, we're going to wrap it up today. And we've been calling this series Becoming a Team. Because at, the, at every chapter, this, there's this big question where Paul's asking, man, how do we become a team? We've got so many different personalities. We've got so many different cultures here. Everything's kind of trying to take our, uh, take our focus. And today, in the last chapter, we see Paul, who's the head coach of the church, reveal what's constantly on his mind. And so with the message uh, today, we've, uh, we've decided to call it the heart of a team. And today, if, if you're a leader of a company, maybe you're a CEO or, or, uh, or uh, you work at a company, I want to let you know what's constantly on your CEO's mind, all right? If maybe you're a coach or you play on a football team, I'm going to let you know what's constantly on your, co- your head coach's mind. And today, you're also going to know how to pray for me every week because these six things are constantly on my mind, all right? And so... And so it's also on the mind of every father in this church today, okay? Paul's the spiritual father of that church. And how many of y'all know that the last things that get mentioned are the most important things? You know, I remember hearing a guy on his, uh, on his deathbed <laughs> was talking, this is whenever the Cubs, before we won our World Series a couple of years ago. And the guy said that, uh, uh, that, uh, that his father's last words uh, for him, lifelong Cubs fan, he, uh, he looked up at him and his last words, he looked up at him and he goes, we need to trade Sean Dunstan. And then he closed his eyes and he died right there. So you're like, man, this guy was waiting his whole life to see uh, the Cubs win. And today I want to show you what's always on the mind of a, of a leader and, uh, and church planners and, uh, and your coaches, your CEOs. So what's the first thing on every leader's mind that creates the heart of the team? The first thing that's on Paul's mind in chapter, uh, chapter 16 is number one, write this down, the money. Some of you are like, oh, yes, I was hoping Chad would talk about money today. And I'm like, man, because you guys love giving so much, I just want to nurture that gift of yours, all right? So look at what verse 1 says this. Paul says, now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. In other words, uh, we ain't got to take up a second offering, all right? Just be setting some money aside, all right? And it says, then when I arrive, I'll give you the letters of introduction to the men who you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. Now, time out. What's happened here is that the church of Jerusalem is going through a famine. And the reason why the Corinthian church is setting aside money there and saving up to bless them is because that church at Jerusalem helped start the church at Corinth. All right. Sometimes we're on the giving in, and sometimes we need to be on the receiving in from, uh, from God's people. Amen. And so this is exactly where they are. He says, if this thing's advisable for me to go also, they'll accompany, uh, they'll accompany me, and after I go to Macedonia, I'll come to you, and I'll be going through Macedonia. And so right out of the chute, Paul's talking about the money. All right. And what's the first thing that's on, uh, on a leader's mind constantly? The money. So we talk about the money. Same thing for a head coach. You know that? It's not just X's and O's. A lot of times it's fundraising. And great coaches are also great fundraisers where they get people bought in, where they're constantly thinking, if we had this, we could do this, which would help this. A CEO is constantly thinking about it. All right, here's the next thing we need to do. How are we going to pay for this? Is this in the budget? How do we grow the bottom line without draining the resources? A dad, uh, we're constantly thinking about, man, how am I going to pay for this? Now, some, there may be a dad here uh, this morning where he comes home and he's in a good mood. And all of a sudden he sees, uh, sees mom and, and his son. He goes, well, how did the dentist appointment go today? And all of a sudden he gets that great, great, great report that he's had four cavities. And within the next three months, the boy has to have braces. And dad says, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Even though the boy sucked on a pacifier till he was five. And I told you one day we were going to have to have braces for this boy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to fix this boy's crooked teeth oh he's so happy <laughs> and he while he speaks faith in front of that boy he's like how in god's name are we gonna pray for the uh, pay for this youngest braces and then the daughter comes in the room and she's been taking gymnastics 
And she says, Dad, great news. And he's like, what? Lay it on me. And she says, Dad, my gymnastic coach says that not only do I need to be in his, that I need to take advanced gymnastic lessons. And for the low, low price of only $500 a month, he says that I can do this. And the dad goes, hallelujah, praise God. Look out, Simone Biles. My daughter's going to be the next gold, gold medal winner. And all of a sudden, he's got all this faith in front of them. And as soon as them kids leave, uh, leave the room, he looks at his wife and goes, how are we going to pay for all this? Can I tell you, it's constantly on a dad's mind. And it's also on, on mom's, uh, mom's mind. Kids and teenagers, while y'all are in here, let me just tell you something. You're never going to know how much your parents sacrificed for you. My, my dad went to business meetings with holes in his shoes, but I never did without cleats for baseball or football. And so today, here, I'm giving you an assignment. If, you're, if you, my, my mom didn't buy herself new clothes for years, but Laura and Colleen always had homecoming and prom dresses and, and pageant dresses, all that stuff. Students, today, if I'm your pastor, do one thing for me. Sometime today, lean over and hug your parents and say, I know how much you sacrificed to give me a better life, and I sure do love you. Some of you are like, man, my parents will see through that. They'll think I'm hitting them up for a loan. Hit them up for a loan later, all right? And someone, my dad, he'll be like, oh, whatever and everything. And he'll walk around the corner and cry. I'm telling you what I know, all right? And Paul says this, each Christian needs to give. And so we believe that as well. And uh, some people are like, if you're a Christian, how much should you give? Well, Paul says here, set aside the first day of the week. where you, uh, On the first day of the week, set aside a sum of money. And this is in line with keeping with the Old Testament custom of first fruits, all right? He says, you give your best to God, because, and you give to God first because God is our highest priority. Jesus says, wherever our treasure is, that's where our heart is. And so our money goes to that which we value. Moms and dads, can I tell you what you can do with your kids, even in kids' church. Don't just give them a couple of quarters to be able to, uh, to, uh, to give in, uh, in tithes and offerings over there at Coastal Kids. Make them fill out an envelope like I do Evan. And one of the coolest things that they'll be in at the end of the year, like, my gosh, I gave over $100 to the church? I'm like, yeah, you're tracking right here. Me and Evan have this thing whenever we give our tithes. We fill out the envelope. A portion of my tithes gets paid online. But uh, there's also a portion, because it's worship to me, that every Friday on my payday, I come in here and I drop off, uh, drop off my, uh, my tithes and offerings. And when we put it in, that, uh, in that, uh, uh, that giving box, guess what me and Evan always say? You did it again. God, thank you so much. I gladly pay you first. I gladly give you the first fruits because you gave me your first and your best. So when we give to God uh, first, that means God's the most important thing in our life. And if God never gets any money from us, then we have to ask, is God really a priority for us? All right. And so uh, in 2 Corinthians, because there, there's a follow-up to, uh, to 1 Corinthians, we're not going to go into uh, 2 Corinthians, but he has to readdress the issue of giving. And what he tells them in 2 Corinthians, that financial uh, giving uh, should be uh, three different ways. It should should be given this way. Cheerfully, sacrificially, and regularly. All right? Those are the three uh, categories of giving. So cheerfully. God, you did it again. Whenever I put it in there. Or whenever you go online and you and, and you click that button, you're like, God, thank you so much. You've blessed me. I'm glad to be able to. You're supposed to laugh deeply whenever you give. We're like, this is fun, all right? This is great. So we do it with cheerfulness. And it also means sacrificially. What does that mean? It means if you're a teenager or a college student, it may not be much, but the sacrifice is still great. All right? And let me let you know something. In the body of Christ, it's not about having equal gifts, it's about having equal sacrifice. Where families, we all, and can I, uh, can I just apologize to you in the days ahead? I'm going to get better in teaching our church the one principle that we see constantly in the New Testament. We've got to be able to learn, especially in this culture, to learn how to be more sacrificial. And we're going to talk about that in the days ahead. And lastly, it says that giving should be done regularly. It means more than once every presidential election, okay? Where uh, we're like, oh, dude, uh, I, I, need to be, I need to be faithful with this, all right? So the first thing that's on Paul's mind right here, paying the bills. The next thing that's on the, uh, on the pastor's heart is the opportunities. I hope everybody that's a, that's a leader in here, you're like, dude, this is the truth. First thing that's on my mind is the money. The second thing is the, the opportunities. Look at where Paul starts in verse 5. It says, after I go through Macedonia, I'll come to you. For I'll be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I'll even stay with you for a while, or even spend the winter, so that I can, uh, so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. 
for I don't want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened to me and there are many who oppose me. Now watch this. I want you to notice the correlation. The opportunities always follow the money. Okay? Our goal here at Coastal Church is that you can always find where the money is spent. All right? You know the priorities from the second you drive up on this campus here. This is a priority where you see generosity happen all the time. Where you look around, you'd never see need here because your generosity makes things happen for us. Now, here's the thing you got to understand. Our ministry opportunities will never outgrow your generosity because the two are one and the same. And because of we, we believe in being radically generous, we also being, uh, believe in being very, very financially transparent with you, all right? Where I, everybody knows here, uh, around here on our team, the budgeting process here begins in October, where in January, the new budget is in place, and we plan on helping, uh, helping with new opportunities. There may be some things where like, okay, this particular ministry is underperforming. This year, we probably need to give them more. There are some that are like, man, they're going through the roof. We need to bless them with more. And there may be some that are like, you know what? On this, we may be killing some drives, some incentive. This year, they need to make it happen on less because we've overfunded for a while. And then we look at some and like, you know what, dude? There's just some we just need to cut off. Now, we take a long time before we eliminate certain things. And we, we make sure that uh, we fed this thing to the best of our ability. But, uh, but that's how it all goes. So I want to let make sure everybody knows. We share this at least three times a year what our, uh, our budgeting process is, okay? Our budget is set to 90% of what came in the previous year, all right? We don't budget on faith here. The, them numbers, they have a reason. And so we don't budget 110% of what came in. Well, we're just going to grow. You know, maybe you don't. Uh, we we want to make sure that, uh, that, that we budget properly. But the first thing you need to see, every dollar gets broke down this way. 11 cents of every one of your dollars goes to local, regional, national, and international missions. Goes right out the door. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be generous. And I'm so proud to let you know that last year, with this 11% and your dollar club, we gave over $350,000 away in every one of these categories. A total of $350,000 went out the door. All right? The other thing. The uh, 35 cents of every dollar goes to buildings and maintenance. 35, uh, 35 cents of every dollar goes to salaries and benefits. By the way, this is if you're a leader right now and you have control of the budget, if you're a CFO, I would very highly encourage you to model uh, uh, this, uh, the 35% on those two because I've learned that whether it be a church or whether it be a business, any type of organization, three things kill spontaneous growth. Uh, spontaneous growth in a company or in a church and it's this big budgets big buildings and big egos all right so today i hope you're seeing we checking our ego at the door and you're learning everything about where the money goes 14 percent goes to departmental ministries and five percent to savings we believe in savings here okay we believe that we have an emergency fund but brothers and sisters let me let you know something we also don't believe in having millions and millions and millions. I know some churches, even some ch uh, churches not too far from here, they've got millions in savings and they are irrelevant in their community. That is a slap in the face of God, in my opinion. I believe, yes, it's good to be debt free. The goal of a Christ follower should not be to have less. It should be to give more. All right, And so, yeah, we're not having this big old pile of money that the Antichrist gets to spend whenever we're raptured out of here. All right, But we are going to be prepared just in case there's a hurricane or something like that. That's just wisdom. All right, So as an organization grows and matures, more opportunities come its way. The same thing happens for a business that can expand and get into new arenas. A successful sports team, you get invited to play in tournaments and play on ESPN. Same thing happens with a church. Now, watch this. There are so many opportunities to show and share the love of Jesus with people in real ways that the pastoral staff and I, what we have to be able to do is guard our focus and only do those five things that only we can do. And what our job is to empower everybody else on your passion and your focus, and that's where small groups come into play. All right? 
We have well over 200 small groups in our church. And today, before you leave, there our small group fair is going on on our splash pad in our cafe. Swing by, spend just a couple of minutes there and be like, man, I can't believe. They've actually got this thing where the, and look, it's not just necessarily a Bible study. There's a lot of hobby stuff, a lot of social groups. I looked at one, uh, one guy earlier and I was like, what? he's wearing a darn sombrero. I said, what in the world are you doing? He said, dude, my, uh, my group, we meet every two weeks at the local Mexican joint. And he goes, and, uh, he go, and I was like, uh, dude, I want to come. He goes, you can't, we're full. <laughs> he said, well, all, all we can take is 30 people. I was like, well, keep me on the list for the next time. I was like, I used to think I could go to any meeting at this church. But no, uh, but no he's like, man, uh, and so we were talking about that. There's tons of opportunities. And here's what small groups do. It helps us to expand and reach uh, uh, to people and where you, whatever you're into, you can turn it into ministry. But, and at the same time, we empower you so that the pastors of the church, we can focus on what, uh, what God's called us to do. All right. Next thing on Paul's mind, the leaders. All right. He mentions uh, just a few here in verse 10. It says, when Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he's with you. For he's carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. No one then should treat him with contempt. Send him on his way in peace so that he may return to me. I'm expecting him along with the brothers. And now about our brother Apollos, I strongly urge him to go uh, to you with the brothers. And he was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. What Paul is saying is as his ministry is increasing, he's raising up more leaders to be able to take on where he can do what only he can do, all right? And he's talking about this. Growing and training leaders are constantly on your coach's mind, constantly on your boss's mind, and constantly on your pastor's mind. We've got to be able to raise up people. The Bible says the harvest is plentiful. What I've got to be able to do is not believe uh, Jesus uh, to save people every week because he said the harvest is already here. You know what, uh, what bothers me? Whenever preachers get up and start preaching about revival, Jesus never said a revival is coming. You know what he said? The harvest is here. All right, And what we're doing, we want to raise up leaders all the time to be able to help us gather in the harvest. We're constantly looking at, okay, what's the next seed to sow? Where do we need to be? And let me let you know, you are the greatest church in the world. All right? And I'll just say that flippantly. Y'all have the sweetest spirits. You are the easiest people I've ever been around in my life to lead. But not every church is like that, are they? Where, my God, there are some Christians that are meaner than a darn pit bull. And I'm like, you, what are you, what's the matter with you? Why are you so angry? Well, and you just begin to see this. Can I let you know something about our country? So many different people are saying, we have a political problem in our country right now. We don't have a political problem. Well, we have a leadership crisis in our country. No, we don't. Let me tell you what kind of problem we have in America. We have an authority problem because we don't listen to nobody. I see the same stuff spoken about President Trump that was spoken about President Obama. You know why? Because we don't like anybody in charge. And let me let you know, ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Spirit is trying to make sure that we all the time model in our church, in our culture, we are creating a culture of honor. We honor the office. We speak truth to power, but we do it in a loving way because that is what God has called us to do. Now, we vote according to our convictions, and let me let you know something. There are certain things in this world right now where far too many of us, we're posting our way out of promotion. We're getting on Facebook and letting everybody, I got to keep it real, Pastor Dan. Let me tell you what keeping it real is going to do. It's going to keep you real broke. Well, I want a new job. Guess what? What if that new job, what if, what if your boss is a Republican? I don't want to work for no Republican. Well, guess what? You're going to be broke. I don't want to work for a Democrat, Pastor Chad. You better quit being stupid and be wanting to take care of your family. I've watched too many Christians over there just talk all kind of crazy stuff. Do you want to provide for your family? You can serve anybody. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good, but this is, you all know this preacher's preaching right. This ain't no red church. This ain't no blue church. We're, we're a purple church. All right, we got a little, a little red, a little green. Uh, those green party weirdos. We got them in our church too. We got red, we got blue, and so we're all kind of mixed in together. But watch this. What we got to be able to understand is that God will never put us in charge until we learn how to serve the authority that's above us. If the boss, well, Pastor Chad, I don't agree with what the boss is doing. You get paid to make suggestions. The boss gets paid to make decisions. And let me let you in on a little secret that my daddy taught me a long time ago. The boss is not always right. But the boss is always 
the boss. All right? Well, I, what if I disagree with it? Submit. Unless it's, a, uh, unless it's a legal, immoral, or unethical, submit. Well, I don't agree with it. Well, technically, uh, uh, <laughs> submitting means that you don't agree. But guess what? That's off your pay grade right now. And how you serve that boss is exactly how the next cat is going to serve you when you're in charge. Okay? So the, uh, the next point was on his heart is next. Boy, you guys are going to love this. Fourth thing that's on the, uh, the heart of every pastor, the men. Ladies, you'll get yours here in just a second, okay? So, but uh, watch this. Verse 13 says, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. He's talking to the men of the church. I love what the, uh, the uh, ESV version, you know what it says this? He says this, be strong, act like a man. And let me let you know something. The men are constantly on my heart of this church. You know why? Because as go the men, so goes the church. The strength of any church is the strength of a man, uh, is the strength of the men in that church. I was recently doing some consulting for a guy, and he was like, man, y'all got so many dudes in this church. I was like, yeah, we designed it that way. And not to discriminate, we want everybody that wants to be able to come here, but we have created an atmosphere where, guy, where it's dude-friendly, all right, and, uh, where, and I've had hundreds of ladies say, this is the only church. I've been praying for years for my husband to go to church. This is the only church my, uh, my husband will ever go to. We designed it that way. Do you know why? Because if, you, uh, if we win men in our church, you win the dad, 93% chance says that the whole family will be saved and loving God if you win the father. And so that's, that's being smart. But also, I, I was helping out this, uh, this church, and they're like, man, Pastor Chad, we want to get men in our church. And, and, I'll, uh, and can, can, can you uh, come and do some consulting with us? I was like, yeah. And so I walked in the lobby, and I was like, yeah, I know why, I know why you ain't reaching men. And they're like, why? I was like, it looked like somebody threw up Pepto-Bismol in here. Your whole darn lobby's pink. Men don't want to go to a church that looks like their daughter's bedroom. He's like, are you serious? And then I go in the auditorium. All the chairs are pink. You know, ain't no real dude want to sit on no pink chair. I mean, I mean, even if it's black or something like that, they'd rather sit in a metal chair. They're like, man, what is going on? Is this Barbie's Playhouse or this is the house of God? And so I, I, I want to be able to talk to us from the heart of a father. Paul was talking to him from the heart of the father. I don't have the age of a father just yet, but I do have the heart of the father. And one day, the, uh, everybody will be like, that's a, Chad's now the father of the church, but right now, the father of this church is my dad. Where I'm, I'm like, Pastor Chad, we're, we're having marriage problems and uh, stuff like that. Can you counsel us? You don't want anything from me. I've only been married 23 years. Jury's still out on us. What you want to do is go talk to my dad and my mom. They've been married for 49 years. Uh, and you know what? Uh, they done forgot more about marriage than me and Jennifer know. But one day, I'm going to know it all. And then I'll be able to pass it on to you. By the way, uh, after 49 years of marriage... You don't see a lot of people calling it quits after 40. It's kind of like, well, after you pass 40, you're like, ah, eh, well, I'll just stick it out, you know? And then the coolest thing, like, whenever you pass, have y'all ever noticed that there are some couples, like, if they've been married over 50 years, they start looking like each other. You're like, oh, my God, are y'all brothers and sisters? No, that's my wife. We've been married for 65 years. I'm like, y'all look just like each other. Then you see how they look before they got married. It's kind of the funniest thing you ever saw in your life. But here's one of the things that I want to show you. Some guys... In churches that I've, that I've been a part of, they'll say, Pastor Chad, we're not supposed to be strong. We're supposed to be meek. I'm like, you, you do know there's a difference between meekness and weakness, right? Weakness means this, we don't have any strength. Meek means we have strength and we will use it as needed for good. If you're going to need, uh, you're going to need to be strong. When temptation comes, you need to be strong enough to resist it. Some guys, and let me watch those of us, we honor all age groups in our church. But there's this rising thing in people that are about 35 and under that I'm seeing where nobody wants to be strong among our men. Some guys grew up where the strongest guy in their neighborhoods were the bullies and the jerks. And today they say, Pastor Chad, I don't want to be strong. Strong guys are me. No, 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 no. We need to be stronger than those guys because somebody's got to stand up to them. And let me let you know something. If you're a teacher or a principal, what I'm, may, uh, what I'm about to say may offend you, but it is the gospel truth. If you write me a mean email, I'm just going to throw it in the trash or delete it, all right? We have far too many stinking, uh, my, my little boy, they have about three different, uh, uh, what do you call it, assemblies about bullies. And I'm like, uh, Evan's like, we need to stop bullying. And I was like, Dad, uh, son, let me let you know something. You don't stop no bully, you pop a bully. 
That's the only way. And some people are like, oh, Pastor Chad, we need to solve more problems with our words. Let me let you know something. I learned a long time ago in the church world that you can't disciple a demon and you can't cast out the flesh. Some things in our life we're going to have to take a butt whipping for. Well, Pastor Chad, he's bigger than me and he picks on all of us. All of a sudden, invite him around the corner of a building and have about five of them and jump on him and beat the dog crap out of him and that bullying will stop. Somebody grabbed me in the in the lobby earlier, like, well, I'm not gonna call you PC anymore because what you just said is not does not stand for politically correct. <laughs> let me let you know something. That's one of the reasons why everybody, every guy out here needs to at least have played one year of football. You know why? Because football is a game of humility. You can give them licks, but you're gonna take yours too. My, I, I remember I was on a punt return thing one night. We were paying, playing against W.S. Neal. It is in Bruton, Alabama. It is, the high was like 20 that night. It is cold as a dog's nose. And, man, our, our coach had been saying the whole time, Chad, when you go back on this punt return, you got to do what's called keep your head on a swivel. Don't just look in one direction. Constantly be looking. And, man, I ain't listening. I'm like, that old man is wrong. And I'm sitting there, and I'm running just like this. And all of a sudden, this dude hits me right in my ear hole. And, dude, I flip up in the air. Fortunately, my neck broke my fall. And my dad is videotaping the whole thing, and you can hear him rolling, laughing on that thing. And my dad goes, so what were you thinking while you were laying down there on the freezing cold ground? I said, Dad, all I did was just wish I was dead. That was it. It's a game of humility. You know, why, do I talk to, why am I talking to our men this way? I hope you, I hope you uh, allow me a few indulgences. But we live in a culture right now that denigrates men and masculinity. It just does. If you watch the average sitcom, the average sitcom with a married couple, the husband is an idiot. He just is. He's the butt of every joke. He's the gag. He messes everything up. He's an imbecile. Half the time, he's a big, fat, lazy idiot, and everybody laughs at him. He's either a Homer Simpson or a Peter Griffin. That's the, uh, that is the average American sitcom. And right now, here's one. The, some of you guys, you're new to the things of God, and you're new to church. I want you to memorize this one. If you're a man at Coastal Church or you're watching online, there's one verse that I want you to memorize for the rest of your life, and I never want you to forget 1 Corinthians 11, 7 is this man is the image and the glory of God and I will always speak to you and and call out the greatness in you I will honor you and I will expect you to be honorable you need to know what you can be because you are the glory of God and this church will always appeal to your dignity your masculinity your courage and your strength because of the glory of God that you are and so thank you are you seeing in our society right now it's, we've dedicated so much of our government resources to dealing with the women that men beat and the abuse uh, uh, that those children have by neglect and they molest them and violate them and all the crimes that get committed. And as a result, child protective services and our social welfare network and our battered women's shelters and our drug and alcohol rehabilitation centers and our court systems and our prisons and jails are absolutely clogged with men. Let me let you know the best gift that we can give the government Gulf Coast today is people are men who love Jesus. Let me let you know, who are strong and courageous and they do everything in love. It's an amazing thing, dads, whenever I look out and I see you have your hands lifted in worship to God. Your kids, whenever they see you worshiping God and they start going through a crisis, they won't reach for a bottle. They'll reach up and learn how to worship God because they see their dad doing that. I call out the greatness in you. Learn how to worship. I looked over there. There's a big old man on the front row not too long ago. I was like, dear God, a darn bear's done got up in here. I was, like, I was, I was, I was watching on the, on the screens. I was like, my God. It was, it was just this huge man worshiping God. Let me let you know something. This, we, sometimes we don't do it because we like the song. Sometimes we're doing it because we realize we got eyes on us. And we got a model for our kids what we want them to be. My little boy came in the... In the, in the prayer meeting the other night. Is there, he's sitting down there in worship time. We don't do that in our house. I looked at him and I said, what are you doing? Damn, my leg hurts. And I was like, get up. I said, you worship, I said, you, uh, we not only give God our first with our finances, we give our best during worship time. 
And then later on, I talked with him. I said, hey, look, we don't have to talk. You don't have to learn how to play through the pain, son. He looked at me. He goes, Dad, I know. I, I'm sorry. And he goes, you know what I'm sitting there thinking? I probably should have asked God to heal me during my worship time. I was like, yeah, you think? <laughs> Let's model it, dads. Let's be the type of leaders that we wish we had in our life. I had, I've had strong men in my life that I just love and appreciate so much. The, the, the school superintendent of Baldwin County Schools, Y'all see him as the kindly gentleman, Eddie Tyler. Eddie Tyler was my high school football coach. He wasn't kindly or gentle. <laughs> Eddie Tyler, whenever I joined the coaching staff, he and Don Blanchard, who was my defensive coordinator, looked at me and goes, I want to let you know something, Chad. If you ever talk to a child the way that we talk to you, I'm going to have to fire you. All right? And you know what? My senior year, I loathed both of them. But I really hated Coach Tyler. Coach Tyler never, I mean, he drove me and drove me and drove me and stayed on my butt. And I remember thinking, you know what? And when I was 17 years old, if you'd have locked me in a room with Eddie Tyler, Osama bin Laden, and Hitler and given me a gun with two bullets, I'd have shot Eddie Tyler twice to make sure that dude was dead. <laughs> Do you know why? Because the Bible says no discipline seems right at the time. But 25 years from now, 25 years later, there ain't nothing that man won't do, that, that he can do, that uh, can't ask me to do. I'll show up and pray for him. He, he got up and introduced me <laughs> a couple of years ago. And the man started crying, talking about how proud he was. I was like, what is the salty discharge coming from his eyes? I, mean, I didn't, no, no. It's seed time and harvest, guys. And that's what we're going to see. The, uh, the next two things, and I'll, I'll wrap it up. Next thing that he talks about is the community. Talking about getting everybody, uh, everybody connected. He talks about the churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord. Time out. Ladies, this is just for you. Some of us may have gotten raised in a church where a doctrine was built that there ain't supposed to be no women preachers. Because Paul, uh, just in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, says this. Let the women remain silent in the church. And that... That particular verse has been taken so grossly out of context. Can I explain the context to you, please? In the, book, in, in the church at Corinth, the women were stopping the service to ask questions. And Paul was like, hold on. They're holding up the service. Dear God, we're going to be here till midnight. All right? Because the very next verse, he said, let them ask their questions at home. If women were supposed to remain silent in the church, how come 20 verses before in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that Paul tells them if a woman prophesies in the church, she should be respectable? How's it working all out? Well, Pastor Chad, I don't think there need to be uh, women in the church. I heard this a long time ago. My grandfather said this. It doesn't follow a consistent pattern in Scripture. We don't need to be able to believe stuff that we, there, there is no consistent pattern in Scripture. Because the Bible shows that God uses male and female. He does not discriminate according to gender. The same Holy Spirit that got poured out upon a man to speak is the same type of Holy Spirit that will be poured out on a woman. Well, Pastor Chad, I don't know if I agree with that or not. Really? You want to read the Bible in a way that denigrates women? I don't. I think our God is a big God. And the same God that, he's called, uh, he, uh, that has called me can call any woman to do exactly what I'm doing. Because the next verse says this, and so does the church that meets at their house. They were co-pastors, Priscilla and Aquila, fiery preaching woman. All right, all the, uh, all the brothers and sisters send you greetings. Greet another with a holy kiss, all right? So the next thing that's on his mind is, you know what? We got to get people uh, connected to one another. The staff kind of laughs at the fact that I read some books that are really, really hard from time to time. It's not a, a reading sometimes is really, really fun. And a lot of times it's just a discipline. And right now I am reading one of the most boring books on the brain, all right? And I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm counting the pages. Like, how many more? Like, I'm, uh, I'm reading 20, 20 pages a day because I, I want to, the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman need not to be ashamed. I'm going to be well prepared whenever I come and preach before you. I hope you don't mind that. But I was reading this, and all of a sudden, I stepped up. I was reading this book from this doctor. He explained how when you and I feel accepted, our brains literally rewire. I was like, what? Listen to what he says. He said, all of us have a judge that we carry around in our heads. That judge is harsh, highly critical, and causes very damaging self-talk. 
Words like, I'm a loser. I'm just a drunk. I'm just an addict. I'll never make it. That kind of self-talk, watch this, alters the way that our brains work. He says, we begin to use a part of our brain called the emotional amygdala, which triggers four different reactions. Fight, flight, freeze, or fold. You use the wrong part of your brain whenever you have the wrong type of self-talk. He says this, instead of the part of our brain called the prefrontal cortex, which helps us make rational and mature decisions. He says this, watch this, this is awesome. But when we get into the right community of people where we find acceptance and love, they speak the right words that literally help heal and rewire our brains. It changes the message and allows our brains to perform properly again. This is what happens whenever you and I get in community with people, the right kind of people. Some of us right now, you've been walking and and been struggling for such a long time. You need to change your playmates and you need to change your playground. You need to get involved with some people that are going to speak some life over you instead of that same junk and death that you've been hearing for all these other years. God has put people like that in this church. And whenever you get involved, guess what happens? The Greek word for acceptance means this, to take to oneself. It's kind of like whenever you would greet somebody they hadn't seen in a long time. Hey! And you, you're just so glad to be able to you take them in and you hug them. It's a word of connection and friendship. And let me let you know something before we wrap it all up. As Christ followers, you and I, we don't have condemnation for anybody, do we? Because we can remember way on back whenever you're like, oh, yeah, I was a lot more stupid than they were. So I got grace and all kinds of stuff for them because, dude, I, it wasn't a long until, until, it seems like just yesterday, I was just as dumb. And then all of a sudden they start getting in a relationship with you and like, God, I'm not so bad. You were so jacked up. Why are they let you lead this church? What? I was like, no, Jesus has healed me from that. Watch this. Understand, ladies and gentlemen, we, we and I have no condemnation for us because the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We don't have it on us and we don't have it in us. And so anybody that's speaking condemnation over somebody else does not know the same Jesus that, that set you and I free. Okay, so we see this, that this is uh, where Paul, he's talking about getting people connected, getting people committed. Not only con- uh, connected, but involved. People that don't get involved in the life of the church, they bail. It's just a fact. And that's the reason why we're, we're constantly, this month, you're going to be, uh, you're, you've been hearing, every, where, where are your gifts? Where are you serving? Have you been a part of Discover Coastal yet? Where do you, where do you serve in this church because you are a part of this family? They did, a, uh, they did a test years back about all the runaway kids in America. They all had one thing in common. It wasn't they were socially, uh, socially awkward. It wasn't that they were mentally or physically or sexually abused. Guess what they all had in common? Not one of them had chores to do at their house. Whenever you serve in your family, you feel like you're part of a family. All right? And then the final three verses is the conclusion. What do you think Paul's going to talk about? What do you think's last on his mind and on his heart? Because you always save the best for last. Jesus. You want to pray for PC on a regular basis? Pray that I always keep it all about Jesus. Paul talks about Jesus in, uh, in four of the last three verses. He says this, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. If anybody does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Come, Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Four times in three verses. You know how you can tell a pastor loves you? By constantly pointing you to Jesus. Whenever I I need help and I call my pastor, he's constantly pointing me back to Jesus. If you want to know what, if this is your first Sunday and you're wanting to know what Coastal Church is all about, it's all about Jesus. It's Jesus in the morning. It's Jesus at noontime. It's Jesus in the afternoon. It's Jesus at supper time and it's Jesus at bedtime it's all about Jesus all the time and that's the reason why we constantly say the Gulf Coast will be saved this is our heart's cry because we believe it's the heart of the uh, heart of the father for our area and I love it in verse 22 it's kind of funny how Paul puts it he says if anybody does not love the Lord that's Jesus a curse be on him I started laughing I was like you know Paul's gonna be ornery you know even while he's talking about Jesus he's kind of a little bit ticked off he's like Dude, oh, that's cool, y'all. Uh, you're in the church, we love you, but if you don't love Jesus, the curse is on your life. Well, thank you, Mr. Warm and Fuzzy. <laughs> but you know what? If Paul was standing here today, 2,000 years later, he'd tell us the same thing. 
He'd tell us, if you're here today and you haven't repented of your sin and trusted in Jesus, then you're separated. You're away from God. You're living under the curse. You're not living how God designed you to be. And can I tell you, later on, he goes back and he readdresses this in, in 2 Corinthians. I'll give you this last verse and then we can go. He said this about the problem of our world is sin, and the answer to that sin is Jesus. And he says this, that God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that in him we might become in the righteousness of God. The great reformer and theologian, Martin Luther, you know what he called this particular passage? He called it the great exchange. He said, I'm exchanging all of my sin for all of God, uh, all of Jesus' goodness. I'm trading all of my shame and my sorrow for his goodness, his righteousness, his peace, his joy. What do we do? What do we do to deserve that? Nothing. It's the grace of God. It's something that was here before we ever even walked on the planet. Ladies and gentlemen, may we, in this last message, may we be reminded of everything that Jesus has done for us. May we never forget where we were when Jesus found us. Some of us, maybe you didn't have a very dramatic life whenever you gave your life to Christ, and we applaud you. Very much so. With a lot of drama comes a lot of pain, don't it? But there were some of us, we were really, really messed up. June the 9th of 1993, I had nothing to offer Jesus except mistakes. Shame, I'd embarrassed my family. I had, I'd let so many things get out of control. Court-ordered rehab, boy, isn't that a, isn't that a great thing that your, your parents get to pay for? And I thought that it was too good to be true. How in the world can I ever live in freedom for the rest of my life? It's the goodness and grace of God. Can I just tell you, some of us today, the Holy Spirit just wants to say to you, we do not have to live like this anymore. God leads us one step at a time and he fixes us one issue at a time. Instead of focusing on our weaknesses, why don't we do what Paul just talked about and learn just to focus on Jesus. You get close to Jesus, all this other stuff will take care of itself, okay? Some of us right now, you have no confidence in yourself anymore. You're not supposed to have any confidence in yourself. You can't have confidence in the work of Jesus Christ in your life, though. Where, you know what? There's going to come a day whenever this temptation is not near as strong as it used to be. You know why? Because you got closer to Jesus. Where... Yeah, man, I remember I could hardly make it through a day without this addiction taking over. But every day, I laid it down to Jesus. You know what? It lost its grip because we learned that we're not supposed to carry this by ourselves anymore. God loves us too much to leave us the same. And I hope that as we wrap up this series, we see that's the heart of our Father. That's the heart of our Father that we look in and we say, you know what? I do see that there was dysfunction in that church, but there was also great, great grace. <laughs> if you're looking for the perfect church, that is not this one. We are a bunch of imperfect people that are learning every day that, yeah, we're all screwed up. We all got some really funny stories, but we all learned that life is better together. And I pray that we'll take advantage of what we've learned. When you and I learn, that, uh, learn to give our problems to Jesus, give our life to Jesus, that's whenever we build a better life for our family. That's also how the Gulf Coast will be safe. Would you stand let's pray? Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you that it's the gift of God. Lord, not that we deserve anything. It's your goodness and your grace. So we lean into that right now. We ask that you would challenge and change us through this series. I pray that, Lord, everything that we've learned, Lord, we'd hide your word in our heart that we may not sin against you. And Lord, that you, we would be the type of people that you want to use in ways that we never dreamt or imagined. We're going to put, we're going to obey what we've learned, and we're going to trust you to do what only you can do in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed, with nobody looking around, please nobody moving. If you're here today, 
and you've never given your life to Christ. You've never begun your relationship with Christ, but you're like, man, there seems like there's been something pulling on me. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the God that created you that wants to have a relationship with you. Or maybe you one time served God, but you've drifted and fallen away, and you miss the grace of God. You're here, and you're like, man, I miss the anointing. I miss the grace of God. I need to get back in relationship with God. I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you forward. I just want an opportunity to pray for you. The biggest win for our church tonight is that you would be able to leave here today and be able to put your head on your pillow knowing that you're right with God. So with nobody looking around, if you say, that's me, Pastor Jed, I'm not right with God, would you please pray for me? Would you just lift up your hand real quick? PC, pray for me. I'm not right with God. I want to be right with God today. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? PC, pray for me. I'm not right with God. Is there anybody else? Thank you. Those of you with your hands raised, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray this prayer here in just a second. And after that's over, I want you to check on your Connect card. Give us your information. I began my relationship with Christ today or I recommitted my life to Christ. And we're going to show you how to grow in this, okay? For the rest of us, those of us watching online, those of us watching the cafe, we're all going to pray this prayer together. And you're going to be assured for heaven as if you were already there. Pray this prayer out loud with me, church. Dear Lord Jesus, you know I'm a sinner. And I know I'm a sinner. And I've committed sins. But today, Lord Jesus, I give you those sins. I ask you to come into my heart, wash me clean, and I'll live for you as you show me how. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church, let's give it up for all those who gave their life to Jesus today.